If you have a fraction, like 84 over 180, you can reduce that fraction by looking for factors that are common to the top and the bottom of the fraction. One way to do this would be to say 84 can be written as 2 times 42, 42 can be written as 2 times 21, and 21 can be written as 3 times 7. So I can write the numerator of this fraction as 2 times 2 times 3 times 7. And 180 can be written as 10 times 18, and so on. So I can write the denominator of this fraction as 2 times 2 times 3 times 3 times 5. Now, remember from multiplication of fractions that 3 over 11 times 5 over 7 is equal to the product of the numerators over the product of the denominators. If I can take the product of two fractions and combine them into a single product over product like this, then don't you think I should be able to go back the other way? In other words, if I have a string of numbers over a string of numbers all multiplied, then I should be able to rewrite it as separate fractions. I'm going to do that here. This makes this 2 over 2 times 2 over 2 times 3 over 3 times 7 over 3 times 1 over 5. 2 over 2 is 1. 2 over 2 is 1. 3 over 3 is 1. 7 over 3 times 1 over 5 can be remultiplied, if you will, to give you 7 over 15. 1 times 1 times 1 is 1, and 1 times anything is just that number back again. So this is one way to think about reducing fractions. And in fact, when we first learn how to reduce fractions, a lot of times it's taught this way, at least to start with. As with many things, there's a shortcut. And that is to say that if I can find a common factor to the top and the bottom of a fraction, then I can cancel them. The reason I get away with this is I'm expressing this without rewriting it as a separate fraction. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 2 over 2 is 1. These all mean the same thing. Any other common factors here? There's another copy of 2 in the top and another one in the bottom. A copy of 3 in the top and a copy of 3 in the bottom. Nothing else is common to the top and the bottom. What I have left is 7 times 1 over 3 times 5. Same thing as I got this way. I'd like to make an observation here, though. Notice that the numerator and the denominator of this fraction are all multiplied. This is a product. You don't see any plus signs or minus signs in either the top or the bottom. If there were either a plus or a minus in either place, we'd have to do things differently. And I'll show you an example of a problem like that. But for now, let's just agree to watch out for pluses and minuses. I can only do this if everything here is times. A lot of what we've done in this class has started with an example from the real numbers, and then we've extended that to include variables. And this topic is no different. If I give you the fraction 6 x to the fifth over 12 x to the third, can we reduce this fraction? We sure can. Let's start by rewriting the 6 as a product of its prime factors. I could make a factor tree here. I don't really need to because I, I know that 6 can only be written as 2 times 3. If this were a bigger number, then sure, I'd go ahead and make a factor tree. Now, on the bottom, 
12 can be thought of as 3 times 4, and then 4 is 2 times 2, which means I can write the 12 as 2 times 2 times 3. Notice that it doesn't matter how I start my factor tree. I could have thought of 12 as 2 times 6 instead. Breaking the 6 down gives me 2 times 3. I still have 2 times 2 times 3. So it doesn't matter how I start. All right, that takes care of my 6 and my 12. But what about my x to the fifth? Well, x to the fifth means x times itself five times. So let me write out all five copies of my x in the numerator. And in the denominator, I'm going to write out all three copies of my x. Now I'll go back and look for common factors in the numerator and the denominator. 2 divided by 2 is 1, so I can cancel these factors. Here's another common factor to the numerator and the denominator. Notice I've had to skip over this too because it doesn't have a, a common factor in the top. It's going to be stuck in the bottom. That's okay, that happens. What other common factors do I have in the top and the bottom? Well, I have some x's. This copy of x, this factor of x, and this factor of x in the denominator can cancel each other out because x divided by x is 1 in the same way that 3 divided by 3 or 2 divided by 2 is 1. Here's another copy of x in the top that matches a copy in the bottom. And I have one more. Once I've crossed these out, though, I've run out of copies of x's to cancel down here. I have some left up here, but I don't have any left down here to cancel them with. So I'm done canceling. What have I got left? 2 times 3, those are gone. All three of those x's are gone. These two x's here are still there on the top. What about the bottom? This 2's gone, but this one's still there. The 3 is gone. All three of the x's are gone. So it looks like 2 is the only thing I have left in the denominator. I can simplify this now by rewriting x times x as x squared. Some problems will have numbers in them like this, and others don't have any numbers at all. So, for example, what if I asked you to simplify t to the 8th over t to the 5th? One way to think of that would be to say t to the 8th is t times itself 8 times. t to the 5th means t times itself 5 times. Now let's look for common factors in the top and the bottom. Well, all of the factors in the top are t's and all of the factors in the bottom are t's. So let's just cancel pairs of t's. One in the top, one in the bottom. One in the top, one in the bottom. One in the top, one in the bottom. Now I've run out down here but I still have three copies left in the numerator. I can either write this as t cubed over 1, or I can just leave it as t cubed. Let's do one more. p to the 11th over p to the 6th. p to the 11th means p times itself 11 times p to the sixth means p times itself six times. If I cancel pairs, top and bottom, top and bottom, top and bottom, until I run out, then I can see that another way to write this expression is p to the fifth over one, or just p to the fifth. Why over 1? Well, when I cancel my p's, what I'm really saying here is that p goes into p one time and p goes into p one time. Up here I was kind of saying 2 goes into 2 once, 2 goes into 2 once, 3 goes into 3 once, 3 goes into 3 once, and so on. p goes into p once. So each one of these is really kind of turning into a 1. 
So now I'm going to have p times itself five times, that's p to the fifth, times one, times one, times one, and anything times one is itself. But the bottom is all ones, one times one times one. There's nothing left except ones. One times itself is one. So that's where the one comes from. Here's a big red flag for you. This is not zero, it's one. Can you see a shortcut? If I take out this intermediate work and leave you with just the original problem and its answers, look at the exponents here. Eight and five, how do you get three from eight and five? Well, you subtract them. Here's another way to write this. T to the eighth over T to the fifth is t to the 8 minus 5. 8 minus 5 is 3. p to the 11th over p to the 6th is p to the 11 minus 6. And 11 minus 6 is 5. Nice shortcut. Here's another one with only variables in it. m to the third over m to the seventh. m to the third means m times itself three times. m to the seventh means m times itself seven times. Let's go cancel some of our m's. A copy on the top and one on the bottom, top and bottom, top and bottom, because m goes into m once and m goes into m once. This pair here, m goes into m once and m goes into m once, once and once. So what's left? Well, on the bottom this time I have four m's or m to the fourth. On the top, there's nothing left, but remember it's not zero. It's one times one times one or one. So my answer is one over m to the fourth. In the previous example, I had t to the fifth over one because I had copies left on the top and none left on the bottom. In this example, I have one over m to the fourth because I have copies left on the bottom and none left on the top. If I use my subtraction rule here, I get m to the third over m to the seventh equals m to the three minus seven. Be careful here. 3 minus 7 is negative 4. This is actually not a concept that we're going to deal with in this class. We won't talk about negative exponents beyond this, but you will see them again. Notice that if you have more copies on the bottom of a fraction than you do on the top, you have two different ways to write your answer. As a fraction, or without the use of a fraction, but with a negative exponent. Don't worry about this again this quarter. If you have more copies on the bottom, we'll write our answers as a fraction. Let's do another example. 12 x to the fifth y to the twelfth over 20 x y to the fifteenth. I need to start by rewriting 12 as a product of its prime factors. 12 is 2 times 6 or 3 times 4. Remember, it doesn't matter how you start. And then 6 is 2 times 3. So I can write 12 as 2 times 2 times 3. x to the fifth means x times itself 5 times. y to the twelfth means y times itself 12 times. Okay, let's do the same thing for the denominator. 20 is 4 times 5, and 4 breaks down even further to 2 times 2. x is just x. y to the 15th means y times itself 15 times. Can you see why it's handy to have a shortcut? Let's cancel any common factors that we can. 2 goes into 2 once, and 2 goes into 2 once. 2 goes into 2 once, and 2 goes into 2 once. 
3 goes into 3, but it doesn't go into 5, and vice versa. I cannot cancel these. And in fact, I can't cancel this with anything, because all that's left is 5s, x's, and y's. There are no 3s down here, and there are no 5s up here. So I'm going to be stuck leaving those in my answer. I can cancel this x and this x, but that was the only one I had down there. Nothing else I can cancel any x's with. I'm stuck leaving these ones in my answer. Why? Well, let's see, I've got one copy, two copies. I've got 12 copies on the top and 15 copies on the bottom. So I'm going to be able to cancel all 12 of the copies on the top with 12 out of the 15 copies in the denominator. That's going to leave me with three copies. But notice where they are. They're in the denominator. Let's take stock of what's left. There's a three, one, two, three, four copies of x. And that's it on the top. On the bottom, I've got a five and one, two, three copies of y. That's my answer. Do you think maybe there's a shorter way to do this? There usually is. Let's take a look at this fraction a slightly different way. Remember that I said I can either multiply fractions together to get one big fraction, or I can do the opposite. I can unmultiply them and write them as separate fractions. So let's write a fraction that has just the numbers, a fraction that has just x's, and a fraction that has just y's. Notice that I haven't changed any of the values, any of the exponents, or even the order. All I've done is rewrite this as three separate fractions, one for the numbers, one for one letter, and one for the other letter. Now I can look at each of these pieces separately. What goes into 12 and 20? 4. 4 goes into 12 three times. 4 goes into 20 five times. See my 3 over 5? It's the same 3 over 5 as I have here. There's the 4 that went into 12, and there's the 4 that went into 20. Let's make a note of that down here. Using my subtraction rule, I could now say that x to the fifth over x to the one is x to the five minus one, which is four, and that's over one. Lastly, I can use the subtraction rule for this fraction as well. y to the, the difference between 12 and 15 is three, but make a note of whether the numerator or the denominator has more copies. The denominator has more copies of y, so if I were going to cancel them all out like this, the extras would be left over on the bottom. 15 minus 12 is 3, but the, the y to the 3, the 3 copies of y that I have when I do that subtraction, are going to be on the in the denominator of my fraction, with the 1 on the top. Now I can remultiply my fraction, 3 times x to the 4th, times 1 is 3x to the 4th. 5 times 1 times y cubed is 5y cubed. That's the same thing I got when I did it this way. Using the subtraction rule gives you the same results, but again it's a shortcut. So please be careful that you don't use a shortcut you're not really ready for. If you have any questions, it's actually better to write the whole thing out and cancel by hand. Eventually, when you do that enough, you'll start to see where your leftovers are and what you can do to get the exponents you have left on your various variables. Shall we do one more? Let's do a problem where we can combine these new skills with some other skills that we already have. Eight x cubed over 14 x to the seventh, all squared. Simplify.
This looks daunting, but it's not as bad as you might think. As with many things in algebra, there are multiple ways we could approach this problem. One would be to do exactly what we've been doing for the last few minutes inside the parentheses here. In other words, I could split this fraction up into the number part and the variable part. then reduce the number fraction and reduce the variable fraction. What I did here was look at the fact that I have three copies of x in the numerator and seven in the denominator. If I were to stretch these all out, write them all out as a product, and cancel them individually, I would have canceled all three on the top with three of the ones on the bottom, but since I started with seven on the bottom, that would have left me with four on the bottom. Then I can rewrite my fraction as four over seven times one over x to the fourth. Now, let's recombine these into a single fraction. Four times one over seven times x to the fourth, but that's all still inside these parentheses and squared. I showed you a property of exponents earlier that looks something like this. If you have a fraction raised to a power, you can take the numerator to the power over the denominator to the power, and that's the property we need to use here. I'm going to rewrite this as the numerator squared over the denominator squared. The numerator is just 4. The denominator is 7x to the 4th. 4 squared is just 16. In the denominator, though, I need to use another property of exponents. Remember this one? A product to a power is the individual factors raised to that power. In other words, a times b to the r is a to the r times b to the r. Here my a is 7. a to the r. And my b is x to the fourth. So I need to square the 7 and the x to the fourth. The numerator is still just 16. And I can evaluate 7 squared is 49. And x to the fourth to the second, well, that's another property of exponents. b to the r all raised to the s is b to the r times s. So I need to multiply my exponents. This is x to the eighth. And that's my final answer. How do I know that these don't reduce? I did all the reduction I could here. Then I just squared them. This 16 is a 4 times a 4. The 49 is a 7 times a 7. There's nothing in common. This is my final answer. Remember I said that wasn't the only way to do this problem? Let's look at it another way. I'm going to use the same properties as I did the last time, but in a different order. First of all, I'm going to observe that I have a fraction raised to a power. So I'm going to rewrite this as the numerator to that power over the denominator to that power. That's using this rule right here. What is my numerator? It's 8x cubed. And my denominator is 14x to the seventh. Now I'm going to use this rule here. 8x cubed, all squared, is 8 squared, x cubed squared. So I'll rewrite this as 8 squared, x cubed squared. And the same thing on the denominator. 14x to the 7th, all squared, is 14 squared, x to the 7th squared. Now. 8 squared 
is 64. And x cubed squared, now I need to use this rule. x to the third, all raised to the second, is x to the 3 times 2. Same thing in the denominator. 14 squared is 196. And x to the 7th, all raised to the 2, is x to the 14th. Multiply your exponents. Now, though, I need to simplify and reduce this fraction. Again, I can start by rewriting it as the number part of my fraction times the variable part of my fraction. Then I can reduce each part and rewrite them as simplified fractions, only multiplying them together at the end. Let's start with the numbers. What goes into both 64 and 196? Well, it's not obvious to me what the biggest number is, but I can certainly tell that 2 goes into both of them. 2 goes into 64 32 times, and 2 goes into 196 98 times. Now that I've done that, I can see that 2 will go in again. So 2 goes into 32 16 times, and 2 goes into 98 49 times. Does anything go into 16 and 49? Well, 16 is 4 times 4, or 2 times 8. It's all made up of 2s. And 49? 7 times 7. It's all made up of 7s. So this is the number part of my fraction fully reduced. 16 over 49. To reduce the variable part of my fraction, I'm going to use the subtraction rule, but remember, you have to be very careful, especially if the number of copies of your variable that you have in the denominator is more than you have in the top. When you subtract 14 and 6, you get 8, but there were way more copies down here than there were up here. So if I cancel all 6 of these and 6 of these ones, I'd have eight copies left, and they'd be left in the denominator. What about the numerator? Remember that x goes into x once, x goes into x once. I'm going to do that all six times up here. So I'm just going to have a product of ones. One times one times one is one. Finally, I can recombine these fractions. 16 times one, is 16. And 49 times x to the 8th is 49x to the 8th. Look, same answer. Personally, I prefer the previous method. In doing this problem the second way, we made these numbers really big and the exponents really big, and then we had to do a lot of work to reduce them again. The last time, we started by reducing inside the parentheses first. That made this inside piece as small as possible, and only then did we square the top and square the bottom. You can do it either way. I tend to want to simplify inside as much as possible before I apply any outside exponents. Okay, this is a little bonus. I promised I would show you why you can't cancel inside a fraction if there's a, a plus or a minus instead of a times. Let's do this as though we could. Now this is incorrect, so I'm going to do it in red, and then I'll show you why it's wrong. Here's what I see a lot. People want to cancel what looks like like factors. This would mean I was left with just 6, 6 over 1, or 6. I've canceled the 8s. But I can't do that. 6 plus 8 is 14. And the denominator here is 8. What goes into both 14 and 8? 2 does. 2 goes into 14 7 times. 2 goes into 8 4 times. The real answer to this problem 
this fraction in its simplified form is 7 over 4. That's very different from 6. The problem is that I'm dividing by 8, but according to this fraction bar, I'm dividing all of this by 8, not just one piece of it. Dividing all of this by 8 means I'm dividing 14 by 8. 14 divided by 8 is not a whole number. In fact, it's 7 over 4. How could I correct this so that I got the right answer? 6 plus 8 over 8 with a plus in the middle. This is a big red flag. I can reduce this fraction as long as I reduce whatever goes into this 8, into this 8, and into this 6. What goes into all three of these? 2. 2 goes into this 8 four times. 2 goes into 8 four times. 2 goes into 6 three times. Doing my arithmetic now, I get 3 plus 4 over 4. 7 over 4 is the correct simplified form of this fraction, not 6. If you reduce a fraction with a plus in it, or a minus, you have to reduce all the pieces, all the terms, not just the convenient ones. This idea is going to come up again in the next section. We've got more work to do with division. In 5.7, we're going to be dividing a polynomial by a monomial. And in 5.8, we're going to be dividing a polynomial by another polynomial.